Hello, and today we have something quite special to talk about. I'm Anthony. I'm Richard. The Oris Calibre 473. Oris say that it took them four years to create this movement. Richard, how much do you think this watch is? <sighs> oh, talk about epitome on the spot. Now, to some people, this watch might look a little bit familiar, and that's because, of course, the big crown pointer date is well established on the Oris repertoire. But what's new about this one is its movement, the 473 movement. And of course, we're not just talking about it today because we can actually show you it. Because if you turn it around, there's a, there's a great display case pack, and this contains um, not only the the new movement at work, but also um, one of the most distinctive features of this watch, which is the power reserve indicator, which is built into the case back. Now, the remarkable thing about this power reserve is it's actually 120 hours. I mean, it, it is very impressive. I mean, you think what, say for example, Hamilton did to achieve what at the time we thought was an impressive 80 hour power reserve. Uh, you know, I believe they had to make some technical alterations to uh, reduce accuracy a bit to generate 80 hours. This is this is in another league. Absolutely. Now, Oris say that it took them four years to create this movement. So, you know, there's obviously a lot of thought and work has gone into it. And that, that to some extent, justifies the price. We'll get into that later on. The other important thing to note is that this, of course, is a, is a manual wind movement. So I've written about this watch and I've been wearing it for a few days. Um, don't forget it's a manual wind with movement as, as I did. But it's one of these watches that the minute I saw it, I really, really liked it. And, and there's a number of things I like about it. Um, but basically, it's the overall aesthetic. You look at this and to me, what do you think, Richard? It screams World War Two. It screams retro. Yeah, it, they've definitely they've definitely taken some kind of inspiration from what I would consider to be the old military watches of World War Two. It's neither Dirty Dozen, it's neither A11, but it, it's definitely got that vintage feel on it. It's 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 Richard Burton and Where Eagles Dare would have it on his wrist, that type of watch. However, when I look at it, I can't make up my mind, is it a pilot's watch or a field watch? Obviously, um, the Big Crown as a concept, it started off life um, as a pilot's watch yeah. from the, the late 30s. Uh, you know, it's called the Big Crown because it's got a big crown. And the reason for that is you can operate it with a gloved hand, which is what a pilot would do. But we were talking about this early, and, and, and you made a very good point, Richard, was that you thought it was a little small for a pilot's watch. Yeah, it, it's. I mean, I mean, we, we've had this watch to play with for obviously a couple of days, and in fact, we were playing with it very late into the night in the office before we left yesterday. I was left a bit undecided with it. I, I'm not suggesting for a second it's not a beautiful piece of engineering, and I, it would be nice to own one because it is beautiful. But I just couldn't make up my mind what it was trying to be. Mm. So yes, I think it's it's perfect size for a field watch. Is it 38? It is 38. Yeah. Perfect size for for me for uh, the archetypal field watch, but is it a little small for a pilot's watch? But then again, have they just transitioned the big crown over to what is clearly a field watch? Because you know a big crown is is equally relevant in you know a field environment. Yeah, I mean, I think I think it's one of these to, to use a little bit of a cliche. It's it's one of these things that's sort of all things to all people. We see so many watches um, from all sorts of brands, from the biggest to the smallest, they have a legacy model. It sort of evolves to fill mm, a number of yeah. different needs. And, and it's really the name that becomes emblematic rather than the mm. function. So, you know, is the big crown here a pilot's watch? Possibly. Um, I don't think I've ever seen a pilot wearing one. but, um, but I, I'm really not sure it's got the instant, immediate legibility mm. that I would associate with a pilot's watch. Mm. That but, would be my personal view on that. I completely get that, but it is a beautiful field watch. And what I really fell in love with about this watch is is the dial and the colour. I think it's absolutely beautiful. It's just stunning. It's a lovely piece of engineering. It's beautifully put together. The point about the legibility is a very good one. Of course, it's called the big crown pointer date because what appears at first glance to be a GMT hand at the bottom isn't a GMT hand at all. It's pointing to the date and you've got the numbers from 1 to 31 um, going around uh, the edge there. And of course, you know, unless you're sort of particularly eagle-eyed, you're not going to have that 
at first glance, but that doesn't matter. The overall aesthetic I love. I mentioned it's related to the big crown pointer date that we know and love. It is slightly different. The font is different. The, the crystal is a little bit flatter. The hands are different. For me, the hands, I don't know exactly what it is about them, but the hands are, are, are what make it such a World War II style watch for me. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree. It, it, it's, it, it's sort of harking back to an era before we had Mercedes hands. Yeah. I'm not sure I can use. Is that a brand name? I'm like, that mean, that's well, generically what they're absolutely, called. Absolutely. You yeah. know, other car manufacturers are available <laughs> who create hands, possibly. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so I, I think, yeah, it's, it's, I, it, to me, it's channeling a pure World War II vintage watch without the, but they've given it a subtlety, I think, that a field watch doesn't necessarily always have. And it's given it a subtlety that a pilot's watch doesn't always necessarily have. So it's almost like they've, they very slightly created their own genre with it, <laughs> if that's not too weird a description. I, because I can't, I can't easily apportion it into anything. Because when you look at the, the, the DNA of that genre, it, it doesn't quite fit into any of them. But maybe that's what makes it so special. Maybe that's what makes it so desirable. Um, and I think it's probably worth commenting on the strap as well, because the strap is beautiful. The strap, as you say, is beautiful. Now, Richard, I have a question for you. Do, do you like venison? I actually do, yes. I like venison too. Do you like this strap? I can see where this is going now. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Because this strap is, is related to venison in that it is made out of deer hide. Now, that's not a coincidence. That's actually part of um, Oris's uh, message of sustainability because um, around where uh, Oris has their HQ in Holstein, um, to the north of Switzerland, right, right near the border of Germany, there's a, a big deer population, and so they have a deer cull. Um, and in order to make sure that none of, none of the none of it is wasted, they actually take the hides and they um, they turn the hides into these straps. It's known as a, a cervo volante strap. A cervo is the Italian word for deer, um, and it's distinguished by this um, this 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 beetle marking here. Now I hadn't got a clue why there was a beetle marking on a deer hide strap, but luckily my friend Richard found out. It's a stag beetle. It's a stag beetle. That's the antler connection. That's why it's there. And that's why it's there. So um, you have this this strap. Um, I think it blends very well with the watch. Um, lovely hard wearing strap. I have to yeah. say that having worn this for a while, the, the quality is absolutely beautiful on it. Um, the buckle's exceptional as well. Yeah. It's beautifully done as well. But the only thing, of course, with that is you're going to have to buy that strap again in the event of it going. Because you're going to want to use that buckle again. You are. Because it is an integral part of the, the sort of the holistic machine all the way around. I, I mean, of course, you could fit it on any aftermarket leather strap it would look great yeah it's got a little quick release mechanism yeah. so very easy to switch I'd, around I'd want to keep that buckle up and running because it looks really good I it think. looks really yeah. good um, I just like the whole aesthetic yeah. of this watch I love the small seconds I love the World War 2 vintage I love the quality I love looking at the case back the power reserve everything Richard how much do you think this watch is um, I'll give you a clue or a starting point the um, the other big crown point of date the existing one which is um, powered by the Older movement called a 403. Um, that's priced at just under £2,000. I think it's £1,950. Um, so, how much? This is obviously a new movement, as I said, four years in the making. And there's all sorts of other little improvements. So, have a look, okay. think carefully, and tell me how much you think this watch retails for. Well, this is interesting because what we deliberately did um, last night when we were playing with the watch is that the price was concealed from me so that we could um, put me on the spot and get me to guess. Um, I think my difficulty is because I can't apportion it immediately to any particular genre. I'm, I'm struggling to think, well, I mean, it gives them a bit of latitude, I guess, to price it how they see fit. So the, the original model, which we actually did a video on and reviewed, which was bronze, which we can put a link up to, that was how much again? 1950. 1950. Um... I mean, this is an exceptional piece. I mean, the, you, you can see the workmanship in it. I, I, I'm going to guess at two seven, two thousand seven hundred pounds. You're, you're half right, and the reason why you're half right is you're right about the seven hundred pounds bit. It's actually three thousand seven hundred pounds. Um, now, is it worth it? I'm going to stick my neck in line and say yes. I think for what you're getting, 
it's absolutely worth it because the quality is exquisite. Mm -hmm. And I like the fact that they have invested so much time and money into creating this movement and going their own path and coming up with this exceptional power reserve of 120 uh, mm -hmm. hours. I completely forgot that it was a manual wind watch when I had it. And, and the fact that I had a moment of panic, I thought it stopped. How come? Well, the reason is I've forgotten to wind it up. Is um, it limited in any way? It's not. No, no. So it's going to become part of the range. Um, right, OK. And, but for now, of course, that's the um, only dial colour available. So um, I don't know if any more different colours are coming in the future. But did, did, When limited. you interviewed Rolf, did he speak about this one at all? Um, he alluded that something something was coming. Right. Up. Okay. Um, so I think I think he did. I mean, I think it's Aurus at the top of their game. Absolutely. I think. And, and I, I freely admit I've got a real ice. soft spot for the brand because my father had an Aurus. Yeah. And I remember it clearly as a child. And he explained to me that it came from Switzerland, and it was when I was really young and learning about watches. So it's a brand that I confess I've never owned, but I've always had in my list of must dos. Do you know what? I'm exactly the same. Yeah. I've never owned, but I've got a huge affection for Oris. I remember them from all sorts of guises. Again, I remember from when, uh, funny enough, my dad had an Oris too. I remember sort of Oris from when I was growing up. I remember them from the days of Formula One sponsorship. When of I was course, in Formula yeah, One. Of course. Um, um, so it's a company I've always known. It's a company I've always liked. Um, and it's filled with great people who are very passionate about what they're doing. I think if you listen to the interview you did with Rolf, which, again, we can link up to, you can see his passion. And I think when you hear a CEO talking with such conviction, and such passion, you can start to understand why they've priced this the way they have. I'm not hugely shocked by the price. I mean, I, admittedly, I was a little bit out, but I'm not hugely shocked because I, I wouldn't need to be convinced about the price. I, I, I get where they're coming from on it. Um, it's whether or not I would actually spend three thousand seven hundred pound. Because there are there is a lot. Because of other stuff I mean, I'm thinking for, for a thousand pound less, I could probably get a Tudor Ranger mm -hmm. if I wanted a really high end field watch. Or could get 20 Hamilton khaki mechanicals. You could. You could <laughs> but, have your own army. Yeah. Very small one. <laughs> if but. I was kitting out my <laughs> own army. <laughs> so, you know, I, I think it's, I think it is expensive. Um, I think people will think of it as expensive, but I think with smart marketing and going the way they're going, I don't think Oris will have trouble justifying the price for it, if, if if that rather convoluted answer makes sense. It does. And I've got another question for you, Richard, as well. Um, we've got, as our regular readers and viewers will know, um, a series of ongoing quests and missions this year. Um, Richard's, uh, I know yours is, is to find a, a, a field watch. The ultimate um, field the ultimate watch. The ultimate field watch, indeed. And, you know, there, there's so many to choose from. Will this be going on the list? Because I think it's a strong contender. I can tell you right now, because I actually wrote the list today, it wasn't on it, and it would now be the most expensive watch on that list, but I, I'm going to put it on it. Wow, fantastic. Another wow. candidate enters what's already a crowded competition. It is. I may drop somebody from the list. Some poor person will be seamlessly removed from the list, but I will add it to the list, because I've, I've already said it is borderline field watch material, mm. and it would be an amazing field watch to actually wear out and about. So yes, it will go on the list and um, we'll do a full review on it from a field watch perspective, which will be a nice parallel to your full review of that watch. I've thoroughly enjoyed wearing it. Um, my thoughts on it will be published very soon, um, if not already. And um, yeah, it's been really, really great wearing it. It's one of the watches that, you know, so far in a relatively short space of time of this year that I think I've bonded with most. I couldn't quite tell you why but just everything about it I think is lovely. So that concludes uh, myself and Richard's initial thoughts on the Oris Calibre 473. A really groundbreaking watch I think that defines very much where Oris has, uh, is going in the future and um, it's a very 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 significant watch indeed. So please subscribe to the channel for more content and we will see you very soon. Bye bye.